Good morning, family. We just thank the Lord for another day. Uh, just thank him for his goodness and his mercy this morning. We will offer up a song of worship unto him. Then the apostle will come with the word for the day. Exodus 15 and 2 said, The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Psalms 34 and 3 reads, O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Psalms 99 and 5, exalt ye the Lord our God and worship at his foot still, for he is holy. Psalms 99 and 9, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. And Psalms 118, 28, Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, we bless your name this morning. Hallelujah. We enter the gates with thanksgiving and the courts with praise. We exalt your name. Thank you, God. Thank you. You. 
Father, we do, we exalt the name of Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, our redeemer, our savior, the lover of our soul. We thank you today. Thank you for allowing us to enter a place of worship with you in spirit and in truth. Father, we posture ourselves to hear your voice, to feel your hand upon our lives, to move upon our hearts, Lord, to move into the righteousness and the holiness of which you have not only called us, but that you have equipped us. Father, I pray this morning that you would bless the ear of the hearer and open the heart of the receiver, God. We want to walk in your way. We want to be epistles being read of all men. We want to be light in darkness. We want to walk in the power and the demonstration of the Holy Ghost as you have given to us. Now, Father, we seat ourselves to hear by your spirit what is being said through the word of God. Lord, may it challenge us, may it provoke us, may it transform us. To your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Will you exalt the Lord this morning? Is he worthy of exaltation this morning? What a beautiful song. What a beautiful God. I will exalt him. We give praise, glory, and honor to God this morning. This beautiful October morning. This beautiful fall morning. We give God the praise. We give God the glory. We give God the honor this morning. We thank him for all of you that have decided to join us this morning and those that will watch the ministry later on this afternoon and perhaps throughout the rest of this week. We thank you this morning and we thank God for you this morning. We speak the blessings of God into your life and into your homes today from his international ministry. Well, as usual, there is a word for the people of God from our great and glorious Father. But before we get into the word of the Lord this morning, I want to talk about something that we're all familiar with to some degree. Many of us find the condition hideous. Many of us would say that this act is appalling. It's offensive. Many of us would say that this condition should not have been, should not be, or should not ever be again. And what's interesting about this, this particular condition is that many of us, have an ancestral association with this condition, if that. Yet we find it appalling. Many of us have not been impacted by the condition directly from a carnal perspective, but yet we find it appalling. We will rise up against it when we see it, most of us. We find it appalling. We find it unacceptable in any form. We'll march against it. We'll speak against it. We'll boycott for it. And yet, many of us have an ancestral association and not a direct connection, if you will. This morning, I just want to talk to you just in the introductory, and you'll understand the place that this condition has as we move through the message this morning. The condition that I'm describing to you this morning is, is slavery. Yeah, 
slavery. But what I'm going to ask you to do this morning, I'm going to ask you to expand your definition of the word, if you will, because I know when I say that word, it conjures various feelings, various emotions, depending upon what your experience is, depending upon what your family's experiences are. It brings with it an idea or a feeling or a thought, emotion, if you will. Although many of us in the 21st century in the United States have never experienced it up close and personal. Normally our experience is by, again, association, previous ancestors, those kinds of things. Slavery, the condition of bondage or enslavement, drudgery or toil. The practice or system of owning slaves. A condition associated with exhausting labor or restricted freedom, and that's important for us today. Exhausting labor or restricted freedom, and you'll see what I'm talking about as we move into this morning's text. As, as we get, begin to allow the Holy Spirit to develop that text through me this morning. Slavery is what we're talking about. Some various types of slavery. I ask you this morning to expand your definition. Because many times you hear the word slavery, particularly in the African American community, you associated with Africa and the slaves that came from Africa. Slave trade from Africa is what we initially associate that with. But this morning when we talk about slavery, we have to expand the definition. We have to add to the insight that we have. Because if we don't, we'll lose sight of the fact that here today in 2020, the 21st century, slavery still continues by the millions. Perhaps you've never considered sex trafficking as slavery, but it is. Forced labor as slavery, but it is. Debt bondage as slavery, but it is. Domestic servitude. What about those that are in arranged marriages that cultures that sanction that? Here's one for you, and it's going to be interesting. Organ trafficking. What about those that are enslaved for, their, for the harvest and the sale of their organs? Perhaps you didn't consider that as slavery this morning. Again, we have to expand this definition of slavery. What is the purpose of slavery? The most basic definition or purpose is to rid oneself of work and force the hideous labor on to someone else. Ah, Brother Chuck, does slavery really exist today? Does it really exist in the 21st century? There's some 40 million people on the continent of Asia alone that are in debt bondage. The Gulf states, the Middle East, Forced labor. I've witnessed it myself. Third country nationals performing the hideous work that the countrymen would not perform because of their wealth. I've witnessed that with my own eyes in the 20th, 21st century. How about the children workers throughout the continent of Africa? How about the children soldiers? who are enslaved to fight for the warlords in Africa. Is that slavery? Folks, I would submit to you today that slavery is alive and well. Ah, that's slavery from the carnal perspective. But this morning we're going to look a little bit deeper into this word slavery, and we have to consider it in the spiritual context. And the reason why we must do that today is because the hideous, the absurd, that which we would not stand for in the natural, 
We partake in, in the spiritual. And we're going to see that today. That, that which is unacceptable to us becomes acceptable to us. That which we would not practice becomes that which we practice. Slavery. This morning we find ourselves in the book of Colossians. Paul is writing to the church. He's addressing the church at Colossae. And the church at Colossae is interesting because it's much like the church today. It's much like society today. We'll mix a little bit of this and we'll mix a little bit of that. We mix a little bit of Judaism and we mix a little bit of that. And we say, okay, it's okay and we love God. We don't know what we believe. It's a mixture of all kinds of things. Colossae was saying it was okay to worship angels. Ah, uh, it may not be angels today, but what is it? What is it? What is that alternate form of worship that we elevate above our God? Paul was making a case to the church at Colossae about the deity of Christ. We would do well to understand that today. We find ourselves this morning in the book of Colossians. The third chapter, verses 1 through 17 and I'm going to read that out of the Amplified Bible this morning. The subtitle is, Put on the New Self. Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ to new life, sharing in his resurrection from the dead, keep seeking the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind and keep focused habitually on the things above, the heavenly things, not on things that are on the earth, which have only temporal value, temporary. For you died to this world, and your new real life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So put to death and deprive of power the evil longings of your earthly body with its sensual, self-centered instincts, immorality, impurity, sinful passion, evil desire, greed, which is a kind of idolatry because it replaces your devotion to God. And in these sinful things, you also once walked when you were habitually living them without the knowledge of Christ. But now, rid yourselves completely of all these things, anger, rage, malice, slander, and obscene, abuse of filthy, vulgar language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, for you have stripped off the old self with its evil practices. Verse number 10, and have put on the new spiritual self who is being continually renewed in true knowledge in the image of him who created the new self. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, nor between nation, whether barbarian or Scythian nor in status, whether slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. So believers are equal in Christ without distinction. So as God's own chosen people who are holy, set apart, sanctified for his purpose, and well-beloved by God himself, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, which has the power to endure whatever injustice or unpleasantness comes with good temper. Bearing graciously with one another and willingly forgiving each other if one has caused a complaint against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you forgive. Beyond all things, put on and wrap yourselves in unselfish love which is the perfect bond of unity. 
For everything is bound together in agreement when each one seeks the best for others. Let the peace of Christ, the inner calm of one who walks daily with him, be the controlling factor in your hearts, deciding and settling questions that arise. To this peace, indeed, you were called as members in one body of believers, and be thankful to God always. Let the spoken word of Christ has it have its home within you, dwelling in your heart and mind, permeating every aspect of your being as you teach spiritual things and admonish and train one another with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual song, songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. Verse 17, whatever you do, no matter what it is, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus and in dependence on him, giving thanks to God the Father through him, Jesus. Ah, Brother Chuck, okay, that's nice, but what in the world does that have to do with slavery this morning? Where are you going with this message? So glad you asked this morning. Colossians is broken up into six sections. This morning we're going to look at section number four. The hortatory section, if you will. Hortatory, just being a fancy word for in, to encourage or to exhort one to an action or a purpose. Hortatory. Paul is exhorting, was exhorting the church at Colossae just as he's exhorting us today. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall endure. So the same exhortation that Colossae received is the same exhortation that the church of the living God received this morning through the words, the inspired words of Paul this morning, the apostle called of God. So what is he exhorting us to? What is this message that Paul was urging the Colossian church to, the church at Colossae. What is the message that he's urging us to this morning? What is it that he's exhorting us to do? What is it that he's encouraging us to do? What is it that he's warning us about this morning? Paul opens up and he begins to tell us, he begins to paint this picture, he begins to create this tapestry, if you will so that we would see his message very clearly this morning. He begins talking about heavenly aspirations and affections. Is what he begins to talk about. He says this in Colossians 3.1. He says, therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, he begins to describe the new life that the believer takes on. He's talking about a post-conversion experience here. He's letting us know that when we accept Christ, but he asked a question that every believer should know the answer to. He says, therefore, if you have been, he makes the statement, therefore, if you have been raised with Christ to a new life, sharing in his resurrection from the dead, well, folks, if you can't answer that question this morning as a believer, let me assist you, if you will. Because the same apostle writes another letter to the church at Ephesus. And what's interesting is a lot that goes on in Ephesus and Colossae, there's a lot going on that's connected there. You will find Ephesians echoes Colossians. And this is what he says in Ephesians 2.6. For those that may be wrestling with or may not understand whether or not they've been raised. Ephesians 2, 6, 6 is clear and it says this. And he raised us up, believers. And he raised us up together with him. When we believed. And seated us with him in heavenly places. Because we are in Christ Jesus. It's a promise to the believer that you've been raised. So we answer that question. We deal with that statement that Paul makes. He says, 
Therefore, if you've been raised with Christ to new life, sharing in, his sharing in his resurrection from the dead, then he gives us some instruction. He says this, he says, keep seeking the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Oh, you say, I'm not physically seated there today. Oh, the day is coming when that manifestation will occur. But through the eyes of God, whose thoughts are higher than our thoughts, whose ways are higher than our ways, we are seated. We have a seat. But Paul begins to instruct us because there was some, some indecision in Colossae. Because they were getting some Judaism, they were getting some things about angels, they were getting about mysticism, they were getting all kinds of things. Things were beginning to waver. So Paul admonishes, Paul tells them. He says, keep seeking the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. It's a continual thing. Keep seeking that. Paul goes on in Ephesians 2.19 and he says this. He says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, outsiders without rights of citizenship. But you are fellow citizens with the saints, God's people, and are members of God's household. Why does he tell them that? Because there's indecision. They don't know what to believe. They're starting to listen to people that are saying things to them. And it's not consistent with the message of the cross. Paul's giving, uh, he's giving an education. He's reminding them of where their citizenship lies. He reminds them of whose household they belong to. He says the household of God. First Peter says this. He said, Beloved, First Peter 2.11 says, Beloved, I urge you, Peter writing, as aliens. Now watch this. Peter comes back and counters in the positive sense what Paul just wrote. Peter takes the other way. So they come at us both ways. Paul said in 19 that you are no longer strangers and aliens outside the household of God. You are now citizens of the house of God. Peter takes the other direction. People, Peter says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world to abstain from the sensual urges, those dishonorable desires that wage war against the soul. Those very things that we learn in Colossians that we are told not to do. Peter comes from the other direction and says this. Paul says that you are not aliens of the kingdom. You are not strangers of the kingdom. You are fellow citizens of the household of God. And Peter said, you are aliens and strangers in the earth. That's what Peter says. And he urges us not to do the dishonorable things that wage war against the soul. Peter, Paul understood that very well. Philippians 3, and we're talking about earthly, I mean, we're talking about heavenly aspirations this morning and heavenly affections this morning. What is it that we aspire to achieve? What is it that we long to do? What is that purpose that we go after with everything that's in us? What are the practices? We hear the word this morning habitually. What is it that you habitually practice this morning? Is it the things that we're being cautioned that the church of Colossae was cautioned about? Or are those the things that we find ourselves pursuing? Philippians 3, 12 through 21. Paul says this. He says, not that I have already attained this goal of being Christ-like or have already been made perfect, but I actively press on so that I may take hold of that perfection for which Christ Jesus took hold of me and made me his own. 
Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it on my own yet. But he said, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind me and reaching forward what lies ahead, I press toward the goal to win the heavenly prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What is Paul talking about? Paul is addressing those. Paul is talking about a spiritual appetite. Paul is addressing salvation specifically. That's what he's talking about. But he's talking about heavenly pursuits. He's talking about heavenly affection is what he's talking about. Paul makes a case, he says, if anybody should brag or boast about his worldly accomplishments, I of all people can do that. He says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, taught under Gamaliel, a Pharisee. But Paul would go on to say that he counted all of those things as done for the, for the knowledge of the excellency of Christ. Paul understood that all his earthly and worldly accomplishments meant absolutely nothing. What did that have to do with slavery, Brother Chuck? Uh, we're getting there. We're getting there. Paul addresses those that reject or oppose the way of salvation, yet he connects worldly appetite and their sensuality with the barrier, with a bar being a barrier to God's plan. He says, brothers and sisters, together, follow my example and observe those who live by the pattern we gave you, the gospel. For there are many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears who live as enemies of the cross of Christ, rejecting and opposing his way of salvation, whose fate is destruction, whose God is their belly, their worldly appetite, their sensuality is their vanity. What is Paul saying? The very things that he wrote to the Colossian church not to do, not to pursue, not to go after. And then he gives them a list of things of what to do and what to go after. He's identifying here that these are the very things that are going to cause people's demise. He calls them, he, he says they're enemies of the cross of Christ is the way that he describes it. These people that practice these or, or try to fulfill their sensual appetite for, for worldliness. He said their God is their belly. Belly, appetite, hunger, thirst. And whose glory is their shame. Who focus their mind on earthly, here we hear it again, on earthly and temporal things. But we are different. But we are different, he says, because our citizenship, he goes back to citizenship again, but our citizenship is in heaven. He says, we're not aliens of heaven. We're not strangers. He says, that's our citizenship. That's who we identify with. That's what your passport reads. That's what your birth certificate reads. Our citizenship is in heaven. And from there, we eagerly await the coming of the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is exhorting us. Hortatory. Paul is exhorting us this morning as citizens of the kingdom to seek heavenly things, to set our mind, our passions, our affections on heavenly things. Going through the kingdom dynamics in my Bible this week, and it said this. It says, spiritual responsibility. The creature that God created is in man is enabled to respond to him, God. Man becomes a response-able being. He is quantitatively a different sort of being endowed with the ability and the freedom to fellowship and participate in life with God. 
One of the things about slavery, ladies and gentlemen, is it restricts freedoms. It restricts your freedom to do certain things. If that individual who you are enslaved or indentured to tells you you can't do something, you can't do it. There's a restriction of freedom there. But as a creature created by the creator, you have the freedom of responding to him. You have the ability to participate and fellowship with him. Slavery, restrictions on freedoms. Whom the son sets free is free indeed. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty to respond the way that God asks us to respond, to operate the way that God asks us to operate, to seek those things that God tells us to seek. Matthew 6, seek ye first what? The kingdom of the earth, the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Ephesians 2, 10 is interesting to me. Because, because Paul begins to make an indirect connection, if you will. He talks about our citizenship, and we went through that. He talks about our citizenship being a heavenly citizenship. We are not alienated. We are not strangers. But we are fellow citizens. We are seated, Ephesians tells us, in heavenly places. And Ephesians says this. Says, for we are his, capital H I S, we are his, God's workmanship, his own masterwork, a work of art, created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, ready to be used for good works, which God prepared for us beforehand, taking paths which he set. So that we would walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. Citizens. Citizens. Contrary to what Paul is telling Colossae not to do. Colossae is being influenced by ungodly people. Who is it this morning that I'm talking to? Who is it this morning that find themselves in a church of Colossae scenario? Who is it this morning that's being influenced by ungodly influence this morning? Who is it that's whispering in your ear? Who is it that's giving you advice this morning? Who is it that's trying to distract your attention from seeking the things that are above? Who is it that's trying to prevent you from pursuing godly things this morning? Paul begins to talk about the workmanship of God. Greek poiema, workmanship. The word signifies that which is manufactured, a product, a design produced by an artisan. An artisan is a specialist, someone that works with their hands. Poiema emphasizes God as master designer of the universe. As his creations, and that's Romans 1.20. And the redeemed believer as his new creation, Ephesians 2.10. Before conversion, our lives have no rhyme or reason. Conversion brings about balance, symmetry, and order. That's what Paul was addressing at Colossae. The lack of order. The lack of symmetry, the lack of balance. We are the workmanship of God. We are the creation of God. God is the artisan. God is the master designer. So he begins to indirectly connect workmanship with citizenship. Not only do are we kingdom citizens, not only do we belong to the kingdom, but we are made. We are made 
by God. We are made by the artisan. We are manufactured. We are a product. Genesis says he formed us from the dust of the earth, breathed into our nostrils, and man became a living soul. Our citizenship is synonymous with the workmanship of God. And I'm so grateful for that this morning. Master designer of the universe. Without restrictions. He doesn't restrict our liberties in the thing that he's calls us to seek. He doesn't restrict our liberties in the things that he causes us to be a passionate about. He's not a slave trader. He's not a slave master. Paul shifts to the affections. Set your mind on things above, not on things in the earth. This is not the carnal mind because the carnal mind will never do this. You will struggle, you will be frustrated because the carnal mind will never do this. This is a spiritual mindset. Uh, but I'm grateful today that the word of the Lord, scripture tells us that we have the mind of Christ through the Holy Spirit of God the key here is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives the Holy Spirit that knows the mind of God and searches the hearts of men it's critical in this piece Romans 8 6 says this he says now the mind of flesh is death Paul writing again both now and forever, because it pursues sin. It pursues those things that he told the Colossian church not to pursue. Anger, wrath, envy, jealousy. That is the pursuit of the flesh, of the carnal mind. He says, but the mind of the spirit is life and peace. The spiritual well-being that comes from walking with God, both now and forever. Paul lays out two directions for life. And he tells us what the ultimate consequences of those two directions are. He implies here something very interesting to me as I read this. He makes an implication here that's interesting that we have to take note of. Christians have an ability to choose to do what is uncharacteristic of a Christian. Namely, to walk according to the flesh. How can you be a kingdom citizen, workmanship of God, with a plan and a purpose, a kingdom plan and purpose, and walk out of purpose? Walk contrary to what God, the way that God is telling you to walk. Seek things that are contrary to what God is telling you to seek. Paul says this is uncharacteristic of a Christian. This is not indicative of Christian character is what Paul is saying. But yet, Paul says that it's, he alludes to it as if it's a possibility. It's uncharacteristic. But there are people that are doing it. That's why he's writing to the church at Colossae. But Paul is saying this should not be. This is uncharacteristic of who you are. Citizen of the kingdom. Seated in heavenly places. Workmanship of God. Nah. This is uncharacteristic for you. John, 1 John 2.15 says this, do not love the world of sin that opposes God and his precepts, nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And that is a strong statement. That is a strong statement. Is he talking about the world, the cosmos? He's talking about our behavior. He's talking about our lifestyle. And one, one thing about this is this. Your lifestyle will tell what you love. There is no, you can't fake the funk on this one. Your lifestyle will tell what you love. Your pursuit of things and, and lack of pursuit of other things will clearly demonstrate 
who you are. When Paul said it's uncharacteristic for a believer to walk this way, what was Paul saying? If I see that, that's not who you are. Contrary to who God designed you to be. Walking in the flesh, walking with worldly desires and passions. Matthew 6, 21 puts it this way. Says where your treasures are. That where your, is where your heart is also. We are encouraged. We are exhorted. To place our treasures in heaven. Where moth and dust and rust does not corrupt. And thieves do not break in and steal. But so many of us today. Are walking in spiritual slavery. So many of us today. Can't break away from the spiritual slavery. Slavery. That is this world that we live in with the passions and the pursuits that are associated with it. Many of us find ourselves in bondage today. Debt bondage. Sex bondage. Greed bondage. Power bondage. All kinds of bondage because our pursuits, we are pursuing the things that Paul instructs us not to pursue. Point number two this morning. We're dealing with the subjugation of the fleshly desires. Subjugate. To bring someone or something over dominion or control. To dominate something. Romans 13.14 says this. But close yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for nor even think about gratifying the flesh in regard to its improper desires. He's on it again in Romans. Paul writing again. Third different letter. Colossae. Ephesus. And now he's at Rome. And he's saying essentially the same thing. Galatians 5.16, he counterbalances and he comes back. He says, but I say, walk habitually in the Holy Spirit. Seek him and be responsive to his guidance. And then you will certainly not carry out the desires of the sinful nature. Paul says, here's the remedy, here's the medicine, which responds impulsively without regard for God and his precepts. Ever see that? Ever see somebody just respond impulsively, spend impulsively, lash out impulsively? Good indication of where they are, what they're pursuing. It's a great indication. Paul is encouraging us and exhorting us this morning to exercise self-control. But he's also saying that you cannot do that without the Holy Spirit. Carnality will never lead to self-control. It will lead to self-indulgence. That's what carnality does. That's who carnality is. It's interesting to me. And we will quote it. I have quoted it. It's interesting to me that we will quote Luke 9, uh, 10, 19. For God has given me power and authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the powers of the enemy. I've got power. After all, I'm a kingdom citizen. I'm the workmanship of God. And I've been empowered through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. That's interesting to me. I'm empowered of God, but enslaved by sin. I'm empowered by God. But I choose to walk in sin. I'm empowered by God. But I can't get away from this sin. Really? 
Is that who we are this morning? Is that who Paul is exhorting us to be this morning? We have power to trample on snakes and scorpions. Overcome all the powers of the enemy, but we don't see our own flesh as the enemy? Is that the problem? Is that our question this morning? Because if we, if we have the power that Luke 10, 19 talks about, yet we can't control those impulsive urges, those impulsive desires, then something's not right. Either we're lying in, in, in our ability to control it or the power of God is not what we say it is. And it ain't the power of God. Okay, moving on, Brother Chuck. Moving on. Moving on. Third point, he says, lay aside evil passions and vices and put on Christian virtues. Drop the vices, pick up the virtues. He begins to give us some specifics. He begins to tell us what to put off and what to put on, what to clothe ourselves in, if you will. He says this in Romans 6.6. 6. He says, for we, Paul again, for we know that our old self, our human nature, talking carnality now, with, without the Holy Spirit, was nailed to the cross with him, Jesus, in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that, here it is, wait for it, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. That we would no longer be enslaved to sin. That we would no longer be slaves to sin. Why did he write? Because he knew that some people were going to walk in. He knew that some people would walk in impulsivity. He knew that some people would walk in things that were uncharacteristic to who they were. Kingdom citizen, workmanship of God. Yeah, yeah. He says we are no longer to be slaves to sin. That sin was nailed to the cross at Calvary when Jesus Christ said it is finished. Old man is our pre-conversion life. He said you were once that. What we were becoming Christians under unrestricted dominion. Subjectivity. Subjugation. Dominion over the flesh. Control over the flesh. Power over the flesh. You want to quote Luke 10, 19 quoted now. Yeah. Power over the flesh. Dominion over the flesh. Yeah, that's right. Our flesh sometimes manifests as the enemy. We don't want to say it. See, the enemy is external. He's not internal. He's external. Well, let me tell you something. Sometimes he's internal. And that same power and that same authority that we find in Luke 10 works on us. Works on Brother Chuck. That same power. We have dominion. We have control over the flesh, over the sin nature. And that's by the power of the Holy Spirit, ladies and gentlemen. Remember that. By the power of the Holy Spirit. The body of sin refers to the sinful nature within us, not the human body, right? Greek verb translated done away with does not mean that we become extinct. Distinct. Extinct. <laughs> but that we have defeated and or deprived the power of sin in our lives is what it means. Old man is unregenerated nature. Ah, but Paul says we're not done. If we're taking something off, we got to put something on. So in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul begins to instruct us on what we need to put on. And he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ that is grafted in, 
joined to him by faith in him as Savior, he is a new creature, reborn and renewed by the Holy Spirit. The old things, the previous moral and spiritual condition have passed away. Behold, new things have come because spiritual awakening brings new life. Brings new life. New kahinos, Greek. New, unused, fresh, novel. The word means new in regard to form and quality and not in terms of time. I'm 60, but I'm new. I'm as new as a brand new Christian. Ephesians 4.22. Still putting stuff on, ladies and gentlemen. And put on the new self, the regenerated and renewed nature. Nature. Created in God's image. Godlike. In the righteousness and holiness of the truth. Living in a way that expresses to God your gratitude for his salvation. How are you living? Does your lifestyle express gratitude to God for saving you? Does your lifestyle express gratitude to God because of his plan and his purpose for your life? We have to answer that question this morning. To put on represents the believer's newly created capacity for a lifestyle of obedience by the Spirit's power. And that's Ephesians 2.10 and 3.16. It's a spiritual renewal, ladies and gentlemen. No, I'm not 60 and then I'm 15 again. It's a spiritual renewal that we're, that we're talking about. Titus 3.5 says this, for we too, and Paul begins to talk about, Titus begins to talk about from whence you came, right? Titus begins to say, Titus says, For we too once were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved. We were enslaved. In slavery, restricted freedoms, drudgery, toil. We were there, Titus says. Deceived, enslaved to various sinful desires. Remember I said slavery in a carnal sense is appalling to all, all of us? Well, what about slavery in a spiritual sense? What about being enslaved to various sinful desires? What about that? What does sin have to do with what we're, where we're going today, Brother Chuck? Here it is right here. Pump your brakes and put it in part now. Here it is. Titus said, we were foolish. We were disobedient. We were deceived. We were enslaved to various sinful desires and pleasures. Spending and wasting our life in malice, envy, hateful, hating one another. Ah, but then he makes a transition in verse number four. He says, but when the goodness and kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared in human form as the man Jesus Christ. He saved us, not because of any works of righteousness that we have done, but because of his own compassion and mercy by the cleansing of the new birth, spiritual transformation and regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Ah, we were once enslaved, but we're free now. Yes. We were once enslaved, but we're liberated now. Then the question becomes simply this. If, in fact, carnal slavery is appalling to us, why can we swallow spiritual slavery? If Christ saved us from that, if slavery was nailed to the cross with him, then why is it so acceptable for us in the kingdom? Jesus. Why do we pursue those things that Paul told Colossae not to pursue? Why is it so easy to walk in and out of the things of God? In disobedience, in obedience, in carnality, in an 
under the control of the Spirit. Come on. Come on, church. Come on, church. Subjugation, dominion over, and power over. Luke 10, 19. Self-appropriate that today, if need be. If that's where you are, self-appropriate today. It's free for the believer. Titus said we were. He said, but when the goodness and the kindness of God, when his love appeared in the form of Jesus Christ, when we experience the regeneration that comes through the Holy Spirit, we're free. Shackles broken. You think Abraham Lincoln emancipated some slaves? Huh? Look to our God and see the liberation that came when Jesus Christ appeared. Yeah, come on, church. Last point this morning. Paul continues to instruct us, and he says, listen, he says, be ruled. De definition of rule is to exercise, is the exercise of authority or control or dominion. He said, be ruled, be ruled by the authority, by the control of God. Be ruled. Let the Holy Spirit have dominion in your life. He said, for he told us earlier, that's the only way you're going to be able to walk it out. He told us that. He told us that. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, you're not going to be able to do this. You're not even going to want to do this. But he says, be ruled by the spirit of peace. With unity and thankfulness. When I think about unity, I think about Psalms 133. How good and pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. For in this place, God commanded a blessing. Blessing resides in a place of unity. Unify your hearts and your mind with God today. Unify your hearts and the mind with the Spirit of the Lord today. Unify your hearts and your mind with the pursuits that Paul is telling us to pursue today. Put off what Paul has instructed us to put on. Put on what Paul is instructing us to put on this morning. Colossians 3.15, let the peace of Christ, the inner calm of one who walks daily with him, be the controlling factor in your hearts, deciding and settling questions that arise. He says, to this peace, indeed, you were called as members of one body, unity, of believers, and be thankful to God always. Slavery is appalling in the carnal sense. None of us in our right minds, none of us with any compassion for anyone, I don't care what your race is. I don't care what your denomination is. I don't care what your color is. I don't care what your country is. I don't care what your color, your background is. Any of us with the compassion of Christ would never sanction slavery in any form. And there are many forms. But we would not sanction that. Yet. Yet. We allow our members as citizens, as kingdom citizens, as the workmanship of God, we will accept, we will accept slavery to sin. We will allow it to happen. We will participate in it. Something that's so appalling from a carnal sense, when it comes to spiritual application, we struggle. We struggle recommendation for you this morning if that's you this morning no condemnation none whatsoever but if that's you this morning you need to allow the Holy Spirit you need to invite the Holy Spirit into your situation into your life now yes. now because you don't want to stand I don't condemn you this morning I encourage you this morning with the words of Paul and his encouragement to the church at Colossae I encourage you this morning I don't condemn you this morning I encourage you this morning but one day, we will all stand before God. Yes. And in that day, encouragement will be over and judgment will begin. So what I'm asking you to do today, if that's you, if that's you, 
invite the Holy Spirit into your life today. Look, Jesus Christ asked the Father for the Holy Spirit. The Father sent the Holy Spirit for our benefit, believers. For our benefit. He knew in and of ourselves we could not negotiate this landscape. So he sent us assistance. We are empowered. We are regenerated. We are renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's here to assist us today. So I encourage you today, if sin, if, if, if slavery to sin has been in your camp, if that's been you, you can't break the chains of that bondage, well, the Holy Spirit is here to help you with that this morning. So what I ask this morning is that you invite the Holy Spirit in. You rely on the Holy Spirit. You ask him to help you. And ask him with expectations. Because that's what he's here for. He will not, he will not disappoint. What I'm going to do this morning as I close this morning, I'm going to do something just a little bit different this morning. What I want to do is I want to bring Renee and Sierra back with the song that they opened up with. And I want to close this particular sermon with that as our anthem this morning. Because Paul is giving us instructions on what to pursue. And really what it boils down to is our pursuit of Christ. Right? Everything that we do, we want to glorify him in thought, in word, and in deed. So this morning I'm going to call them back. Now if there's anybody out there this morning that have not accepted Jesus Christ, hey, today is a great day. Today is a great day. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, if you will believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And with that confession, we believe that you are saved this morning. We ask that you link with a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching, Bible-preaching church where you will be strengthened with other believers and that you will be encouraged. You can learn and be taught and grow and be strengthened. We thank you all this morning for joining us here this morning. And, and we'll let Renee and Sierra... Uh, Begin that song.
invite Renee in this morning. Renee, do you have anything in closing? Just, just encouraging us again. Um, as we ended ministering this song, I was just reminded of one of the scriptures that Chuck spoke about, about us being grateful about the salvation that God has given us. And that should cause us to lift our eyes up and truly exalt God the Father. We have everything that we need. This was a strong and powerful word for me. I'm excited of being able to sit and do the consideration for application because there's so much to unpack. So we just encouraged you again not to be condemned. Mm. This is yeah. the word of the Lord to encourage us so that we are not bound in that slavery anymore. It was very, very relevant for me in my life, and I pray the same for you all. So let's go forward and ready ourselves, allow the Holy Spirit to do what only he can do in our hearts, Amen. you know, to convict us, not to condemn us, but to convict us and provoke us that we would move in righteousness and not allow the enemy to keep us in bondage, nor our flesh. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, May. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, to the only wise God, be honor, glory, forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Thanks for joining in. We love you.